Thank you, folks. It gives me great pleasure to shed some more light on all this um, with the help of uh, Sasha altman Debro. Sorry, it's late. <laughs> um, he is a recovery specialist and co-founder of the Icarus Project and a deeply connected person to the festival. Um, also check out his book, Maps to the Other Side. Um, Sasha, come join us. And he will be talking to Peter Mezen, who is the Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai Medical School, um, and spent some time at Cambridge where he got to know Artie Lang and uh, um, has written about him the kind of uh, some of the articles that have brought a lot of attention to Artie Lang's story um, to the public here in America as well. Um, please, Peter, join us. Thank you very much. Um, hey, so actually, is this mic on? Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. I'm actually gonna, I will, I will just say briefly um, that, uh, yeah, this, this idea of us actually having this, this talk back um, came about because the, like, what you see described in this film, which goes until, like, 1970, there is still, um, there's still an underground of people who, who have these similar ideas and I'm like connected to them. And through that, I got connected to this amazing guy. And so I'm, he's gonna talk first and then I, he's gonna talk first more about like the, the context and the history and then I'm gonna talk about the present day, so. Thanks, Sasha. <clears throat> I'm actually very curious to know what people felt about this, which seems in many ways like a period piece. Uh, but something from a long time ago. And part of what, um, I mean, David Tennant did an amazing job capturing Ronnie Lang's mannerisms and gestures. It's quite, quite remarkable to see it come to life again. Um, but part of what I think was missing was the context in which all this happened, which I don't know how many of you um, were around then, but I thought I would just tell you um, a bit about it from my point of view. I first got to know Ronnie Lang um, as a journalist, um, and I was curious to meet him for a number of reasons, but let me just read to you um, a bit about what I um, once wrote some years ago about him. By the time I met Lang, I was 29 years old at the time, and by then he had become a major culture hero and the most famous living psychiatrist in the world. His book, The Politics of Experience, which was published in 1979, had sold six million copies in the United States alone. To explain how this came about, let me just give you a brief reminder of what was going on in those days. Revolution at the time was in the air everywhere you looked. The political culture, the social culture, the artistic culture, the intellectual culture, all of it was in an uproar. In this country, there'd been the unthinkable assassinations, the Vietnam War was raging, there was the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, and protests everywhere you looked. All this was following an era of social and political conformity, or what I would call the culture of because I say so. Because the president said so, because the generals, the politicians, the local draft board, the police, the doctors, the psychiatrists, and basically everybody's parents said so. The assumption in the 50s was that power and authority were benign and could be trusted to be more or less looking after your best interests. And suddenly it seemed that they were not. Policemen who were supposed to be protecting you were beating up students who were protesting the war. Civil rights marchers were being beaten and killed on the orders of governors and sheriffs. And the soldiers who were no more than kids themselves were either being slaughtered in Vietnam or were killing college students at Kent State 
right here at home. And all of this was playing out every night on everybody's TV. It was very hard to feel at the time that the world had gone, hard not to feel that the world had gone completely crazy or that you had gone completely crazy. Um, not unlike a feeling many of us have now. I was living in London at the time and I had taken a leave of absence from medical school, from the Harvard Medical School. And one of the, one of the reasons that I wanted to meet Lang was one of the experiences that I had while I was at medical school. The chief of psychiatry <coughs> took a bunch of us to visit Metropolitan State Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts, which was, uh, it was one of the worst state mental hospitals in the country at the time. It was ranked, I mean, they actually had a ranking. It was 43rd or 44th, something like that. So this small group of us went through the wards of chronic schizophrenics um, who had been there many, many years, some of them for decades. And then we were taken down to the basement um, where there were three lines of patients. One line patiently waiting for ECT, one line patiently waiting for an insulin coma treatment, and one line waiting for a prefrontal leucotomy. We were, we were uh, s permitted and even suggested that we um, observe each of these procedures since they were the main procedures at the time for dealing with chronic schizophrenics. By the time I saw some poor woman strapped down and put into an insulin coma with a stick in her mouth um, and convulsing, I was nearly throwing up. That, and it was in that era, at that time, that um, along came the books of R.D. Lang, The Divided Self, Self and Others, Politics of the Family, Sanity Madness in the Family. Um, and they struck, these books struck a chord all over the world in people who had begun to think that the social order was contributing more definitively to people's madness than psychiatry had ever uh, considered. I mean, you have to remember how psychiatry was born, it was, um, psychiatry was always an agent of the social order. Um, it began in Paris when the aristocrats were frustrated and um, upset about being robbed in their carriages on the way from their homes to their parties and so on. And so they, the police had everybody rounded up. That included the mad, beggars, prostitutes, um, anybody who happened to be on the streets, they were all rounded up, put in the Hotel de Ville, that became the first psychiatric hospital. And then people began observing their behavior. Um, I actually met Roddy Lang for the first time in a shoe store on the King's Road just by accident um, where I was returning a pair of shoes that had fallen apart. He was trying to buy a pair of sandals and <clears throat> the poor salesman kept bringing him the wrong pair of sandals and um, he came over to me at a certain point Lang very sideways the way he often did to ask permission, ask me where I'd got the jacket I was wearing. I told him he went back to dealing with the salesman and when the guy had brought out the wrong sandals for the third time, Lang said to him, I suppose I could go barefoot, but I'm a doctor, you see, and some people might find it a bit odd. Um, I don't want to take up too much time telling stories about it. Lots of things that happened in this movie 
um, did happen, lots of things didn't happen. A great deal of it is compressed. It uh, went o on over a period of many decades, not just five years. So, um, so I feel like it's this uh, incredible honor to be able to uh, to sit next to this guy and to talk after this film because I feel like what we just got, however flawed it might be, was a historical transmission from uh, from an earlier period of history that I I don't know about. You know, it looks like a bunch of people in the audience were alive for, but I was not alive for. Um, and so, what I'm going to do briefly. Like in a in a couple minutes, is I'm going to tell you some context about the kind of work that that was happening that you saw in this film, how it's happening today, um, and and in order to do that, I'm going to do the same thing that Peter just did, is like frame it historically. So one thing that I think is really important to to understand is that okay, there was that piece that ended in 1970. In the 1980s, there was an enormous switch in this country, right? Like the, the way that we think about psychiatry, um, like I think a good way to tell it is that in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president and is when the DSM-3, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders came out. And it was also the rise of this idea of um, neoliberal economic policies and I, like the, the, an enormous transfer of, of, uh, of wealth from the public to the private and, and the, the rise of consumer culture. And, and, and so I think it's important to like say that stuff because it, it helps you understand like, okay, that's what was happening in the 60s and 70s. The climate that we're living in today, let, like we could talk about Trump, but we don't even have to. I mean, to, to, um, for me as a, as a teenager, I was locked up in a psychiatric institution and diagnosed with a psychotic disorder. And um, the, what they told my mom and uh, you know, the, the, general, the, the general theme is that I had a biological brain disease. Um, and, and at the time, you know, there was like a, still to this day, but in, within the rise in the, in the 80s, there was a, um, an enormous amount of money that was put in by pharmaceutical corporations to, um, to, cre to help uh, bolster like uh, what, what's, what was considered like a grassroots family uh, movement, like the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, which did things like teach classes to my mom about the biological brain disease that I had and how important it was I take medication. Um, what I ended up doing when I was a little bit older was getting together with a bunch of my friends and starting a community called the Icarus Project. Uh, how many people here have heard of the Icarus Project? Let's see. So a good half of the half of the crowd. The thing with the Icarus Project is what we did was we created the space for people, like people like the folks you saw portrayed in this film, who um, had been diagnosed mentally ill and. And one of the things we did that was very important was that like, rather, rather than and drawing polarized lines and saying like, this isn't mental illness or this is mental illness, we said, um, if you use diagnostic categories like schizophrenia or bipolar um, to define yourself, you're welcome to be a part of this community. And if you think all those categories are bullshit, you're equally as welcome to be a part of this community. And if you take psychiatric drugs and the drugs are helpful for you, you're welcome to be a part of this community. And if you don't take the drugs and you think they're poison, you're welcome to be a part of this community. And that, like, in doing that, we created a lot of space for, for people to have conversations that hadn't really been happening. Now, I will tell you this, when, like, when we were having those conversations, none of us were reading R.D. Lang. Like, the, it, we were like, it's very interesting. Like the context in which we were we were having these conversations was way more like we were having them on the internet, um, and it was younger folks, and also a lot of people who weren't being long-term institutionalized, like you were seeing in this film, but people who, um, young people who were getting put on medications, because as my friend Joan over there likes to talk about, there's this enormous um, net, this like that's cast, this psychiatric net where 
like it's inevitable that there's a whole bunch of people like in this audience right now who have ended up in that net and who've been diagnosed with a mental illness and have taken a have taken a medication in their lives. And so that's like a new thing. That wasn't going on back then. Um, okay, so here's the couple things that I'll, that I'll mention just in terms of things that are going on that you, I feel like you should know about. Um, and then we'll have time for a, a couple questions and then we can go home because it's, it's, getting, it's getting on in the evening. Okay, so what you saw at Kingsley Hall that experiment of bringing people together outside of the context of psychiatry lives today in the form of what are called peer respites. That, like, there, and there's a network of them. Before, I, before uh, we watched the film tonight, I looked online, and in, I'm going to name the states where these places exist. And they're places that are not run by professionals, but they're run by people who've been diagnosed with mental illnesses themselves um, and are creating a, a safe space for people to come that's an alternative to hospitals. And so here are states where uh, peer respites exist today in 2018. Uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Ohio, Florida, Georgia, Wisconsin, California, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania. And um, those places are a direct result of, the, there's like, you could draw a line from what we were seeing in this film here to like, that movement there. And then I'll tell you about what I do for a living, which is I, I work at the New York State Psychiatric Institute um, and I work at a program called On Track New York, which is a program to um, reach out to young people who've been diagnosed with psychotic disorders. And there are these teams all over New York State and all over the country that are working to support young people who are having a hard time and, and have uh, been diagnosed. And what I do is I train, um, I, I train people who are called peer specialists. And to be a peer specialist, you have to have been diagnosed with a mental illness. And in the United States today, there's more than 25,000 people who are working as peer specialists in the mental health system. And so that's like, I don't know, use, I feel like that's like useful to know. It's not like it's not problematic. Um, and I, I can't help but say, when I watch a film like this, how much I long for, you know, how much I would love it if we actually had the resources to, um, to open up spaces where people could come and, and heal. Uh, I, think, I, I think that there's like a, you know, we're economically, in the coming years, we're going to be going through really hard times and there isn't going to be funding for, uh, there's going to be less funding than there is now for mental health services. Um, and in some ways, um, I think it's important that we think about uh, ways that we can take care of each other. And, and, I, and I think um, a, key, a key thing, and maybe like where I'll leave it, and um, you know, because, okay, so just to, to tie it all together, the way, that, the way that Peter and I ended up meeting was um, there's this, as I alluded to before, this kind of uh, mad underground that exists of, of people who are working outside the system or who are pe people like me who are working inside the system but have uh, untraditional non-clinical ideas. And um, one of them is this guy, uh, uh, Michael Guy Thompson, who wrote this book, edited this collection of um, articles about R.D. Lang that came out a couple of years ago called The Legacy of R.D. Lang, an appraisal of his contemporary relevance. And I have to say, in reading this book, one of the things that makes me long for is to be a part of a more intellectual climate. I feel like I work in an environment that, that um, really the way I work with really intelligent people, but we're not talking. I feel like the, the, what was happening in the 70s what was happening in the 60s and 70s is that people were talking about existentialist philosophy and people were talking about the human condition. And so much of that language, in some ways, it feels like it's been buried. Like it's like something happened in the 80s that, that like crushed all of these really interesting things that were happening in the 60s and 70s. And it's part of what I think we need to be doing in 2018 and in, in the years to come to, to kind of um, resurrect and 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 figure out how to uh, basically, uh, you know, build the movement that, like, in a, in a totally different political context that's going to be helpful to people. So, that's what I got to say. 
and um, there you go. We try not to be too preachy here. Um, we're going to start with some questions, comments, thoughts from the audience. I'll try not to be preachy, but first of all, thank you very much. This was um, very useful. And Sasha, thank you for talking about some of these uh, movements that that speak to uh, counteracting the medicalization of experience and the urge for uh, suppressing uh, and controlling people, which is very, very frightening. I, I think this some of what's going on right now um, that is disturbing to me, and I'd love to hear both of you comment on this, is that um, after the Florida rampages and the shootings, there has been increased call for rounding, almost rounding up people and labeling people and the um, supposed violent nature of people w with diagnostic, who have been diagnostically labeled and to label more people. And I'm, I, the words like deranged and mad and, and so forth. Um, I'd love to he hear what you think we can do to counteract some of that narrative. Uh, change the administration for, for one thing. Uh, because it, really the language is becoming very, very dangerous. I mean, the president's perfectly willing to uh, get rid of due process and just act around it and pull in people who somebody thinks is dangerous because somebody said something that sounded bad to them. Um, I don't know who the people are who are going to be making these judgments, but um, it's, uh, it's worse than the bad old days in that sense because it's all, it's all sort of surreptitious. I don't know where that's happening or who's going to be doing it. I mean, now he wants to give guns to librarians in Florida um, and to uh, custodians. I mean, I don't know. If my junior high school custodian had a gun, I'd have been very worried. Yeah, OK, so three points. Sasha, use your mic so everyone yeah. can hear. Three points, quickly. <laughs> so. One, I, I feel like what we need to do is like, and we're so, like, I feel like um, sometimes, sometimes in, in uh, when, when political times are so hard, we can find ourselves caught in this um, reactive mode where we're, we find ourselves just fighting against what's happening. Um, when sometimes it can be useful to step back and and first of all, just call out what's happening for what it is. I mean, the foundation, like what, when I go to work every day at the Psychiatric Institute, the way that I think about what I'm doing is not that I'm trying to like help young people who, are, who have mental health problems. No, what I'm doing is like, we live in a really crazy society, just like, like hands down, like, we're, like the, the society that we live in is way sicker than any person that, you know, is going to be receiving services or been given a psychiatric diagnosis. I think, like, you know, Ronnie Lang and I have that in common. That you know, it's like it's a it's like this understanding that it's not about the it's it's not a it, it's not about the individuals. Point two, my job is actually funded. Like my salary is paid for by legislation that was passed after the Sandy Hook massacre, which is creepy if you think about it. But that's you know. The, the, the frame of my job, the idea where all this funding is coming for these first episode psychosis programs is coming straight out of exactly what you're talking about. It's this fear of the crazy people. They're going to shoot up classrooms. And I think that that's, we just like, so I just want to just point that out because I, I think about it a lot. And so in the spirit of, of not reacting but, but stepping outside of it, I'm going to quote you one of my favorite Martin Luther King quotes because I feel like he really had a handle on this stuff back in the late 60s um, and, and this is one of his lesser known quotes. Human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. 
And what does that mean? That means that the people who are normal or who are like fitting into society are not going to be the ones who are going to change things. Like we actually need the people who are different. And so that's like really like fundamental to like that's a really key piece of, um, I don't know, thinking about stuff. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, outstanding film. I'm trying to understand the, the position of the advocacy of LSD. What, what, what you feel about LSD, and, and I understand pharmaceuticals, there's too many pharmaceuticals, can something be done with nutrition, food, and your thoughts about LSD? One of the things that uh, um, got Ronnie Lang incensed was that he um, got this reputation for advocating the use of LSD, that it was a way to drive people sane. Um, that simply wasn't true. I mean, in most of the years that I knew him, um, it was very rare that anybody used it or took it. It was true that at Kingsley Hall, um, there was a period when he was interested in it and Tim Leary was over and Ram Das was over and, um, and so it was kind of the vogue at the time and some people benefited from it, some people didn't. But as far as it's being a therapeutic method, there are certainly still some studies going on, um, not only by the CIA, about um, how to use LSD or other psychedelics. I don't know what kinds of results there were. Incidentally, about Kingsley Hall, this place, this house in the East End of London, which was owned by the Quakers, had had many, many years of good works behind them in different kinds. Gandhi, when he came to London to negotiate for the independence of uh, India, lived in Kingsley Hall. Um, you might have seen there was a picture of him on the wall. So the Quakers leased this place to Lang and his group. Um, and then because of the neighborhood's hostility mainly, they lost their lease after five years. But it isn't true that things simply disappeared. I mean, there were, in the aftermath of Kingsley Hall, seven, eight, nine other community households that opened up, that Lang would visit now and then, but that were sort of other people were living there, crazy people, not so crazy people, um, and they were carrying on that work. So it kind of gave the impression that en everything ended in 1970, which simply wasn't true. I mean, I was at lots of those communities. Whether how much they're still alive and well, I don't really know. I, I was like, feel super honored to <laughs> be a part of this history. I want to ask, answer your question about LSD. So in, from my perspective, you know, the 1960s were such an interesting time, right? Because at the same time that LSD and other psychedelics were, were becoming popular, it was, it was the same time that Thorazine which was which was a you know the antipsychotic also like rose to dominance and in some ways you can see the two drugs as kind of polar opposites of each other right one of them as Otis Huxley talks about one of them um, opens up the doors of perception and one of them closes down the doors of perception I myself um, you know I take psychiatric drugs every day that in some ways you could talk about them closing down my my doors of perception because I feel like if I if I don't take them, I'm kind of, you know, it's kind of as if I'm tripping on LSD. But so I think I, I think there's one thing I would say is that I don't know where your interest comes from, but we are living in times right now where there is actually a lot of psychedelic research going on, um, for, like at NYU, like psilocybin studies that they're doing around like end of life um, cancer studies, you know, helping people, um, and. I think that uh, as a society, we're very scared. We're scared of madness, you know, and that, and and so that, that it's we're like all the, all the antipsychotic drugs that we give to to children kind of uh, reflect that. We're going to take the last three. One, two, three. Hi, I'm trying to put things in uh, 
historical context. I graduated MIT in 1962. In those last two years, I remember there was so much going on. And I think the name that you mentioned, Aldous Hux Huxley, at 100 Memorial Drive in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that's where the use of LSD became very popular. Is that true? I think that might be a conversation for another time. Uh, it is a conversation for another time. But cer certainly, um, uh, Leary and Alpert, who had begun experimenting with LSD, giving it to graduate students um, at the time that got them a lot of trouble and got them fired eventually from Harvard. Um, yeah, that was going on during the early mid-60s. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, I wanted to respond to, Sasha, something you had said about um, kind of like an illness within society, like um, things being wrong within society at large that impacts people's individual mental health. And I want to thank you for bringing that up because um, as this film was going on, I was reminded of another one of my favorite psychiatrists, um, France Manon, who a little bit earlier than this, um, he actually kind of did a similar thing in Algeria with the psych unit that he was on. And he wrote a lot about um, how racism and the colonization of um, people um, from you know the, the French people in Algeria, how that really affects people's psychology in a way that um, can manifest sometimes as things that we label as psychiatric symptoms. Um, and so another thing as the movie was going on that I was kind of thinking about is um, I think like in this film, Dr. Lang is like a, like a superhero. He's like, you know, the one that um, creates this very new and different setting. Um, and I'm reminded of this idea of like superhero activism where I think a lot of how we think of like social justice and change is like individuals or organizations that spearhead movements. Um, and I'm wondering about kind of like an alternative to that in terms of, um, I'm, I guess I'm reminded of the work of um, the feminist scholar Federucci and this idea of the commons and having um, movements be a more collective um, um, creation that is maybe um, doesn't involve as much like power hierarchy and having things really come from the people with lived experience themselves as opposed to um, you know a service provider kind of like the respite center models um, so I guess my question is um, Sasha kind of in the um, work and the different groups that were a part of um, how do you think that intersectionality with like feminism and anti-racism work can occur Okay, that I'm. Thank you so much for thank like everything you said. I, I like. I feel like. I feel like we should. Uh, we should spend a whole lot of time on it, but instead, I'm gonna just try and be really concise. So one, over the years, I've become really conscious that in the culture that we live in, at least, I can't speak to other cultures. There is a real um, the the creating hero narratives is is kind of how uh, how we do things so people love a hero people love a, people love a main character people love a, when they write an article they, they want to have like a person that they're writing about and if you're part of a movement there's a real tension if there's like a bunch of people in that movement like of like some people are just naturally like talk more and are like you know and and feel more comfortable stepping up so I feel like that's I I was thinking about the same thing while we were watching this. As far as Fanon and and um, and thinking about the thinking about colonialism and thinking about just like power dynamics. I mean, I feel like the the movement that I consider myself a part of, and that I feel like you consider yourself a part of, and a, a number of other people in this room consider themselves a part of, isn't just like a mental health advocacy movement. We're a social justice movement that thinks about like very much strategically thinks about race and class and gender and talks about those things and I feel like in the work I do in the mental health system um, one of the things like if you don't remember anything I just said right now and it's just like it goes away try and remember this part okay one of the things that the mental health system does that's this incredible um, um, it, it's it's this incredible way of actually suppressing change 
is that it tells people that they're the problem and that they have, that they're the ones who, you know, they have a biological illness when they're, in fact, there's, there's systemic oppression that is affecting everyone, no matter where we come from, um, and that the history of colonialism and that the, the history of slavery in this country and the history of the indigenous people that lived right here that were, were massacred and, you know, that all of that stuff affects our mental health. And if we're going to be a part of a, a movement um, to change things, we need to think about that stuff. So there you go. That's what I got for you. We lost our mic. There we go. Last question right here. Thank you. Um, so I'll try to be brief. First is a comment you, Sasha, mentioned at the end of your initial introduction that something happened at some point, 70s, 80s, where we stopped talking to each other, kind of, and that's part of the problem. And I think, or the dialogues stopped. And I think what happened, obviously, was the internet. So that's just a comment. But what I wanted to ask was, since you mentioned this group of peer specialists, that you have, I'm wondering if anything has been or will be or is considered that it's going to be done reaching out to people who are victims of or participating in this so-called opioid crisis. Because it seems to me that part of that crisis has to do with the, the mental health of these people, young, old, in between every age, that it's so crossing so many borders and um, it seems that that group would be somewhat qualified to do it. So if I could hear from both of you maybe about that. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so two quick points. One, the work that I do wouldn't exist without the internet. The reason that I, uh, I know all the people that I know, the reason I met this guy, everything happened because of the internet, it, you know? So that's just like, it's not going away. Two, yes, there are, there's like peer work around the opioid, cri opioid crisis, for sure that is happening. One thing I will say, just to like be real clear about peer work, is that like if you take this away, like, a, like once again, like I feel like this is like the key, key point. The thing about people working in peer roles is that they're explicitly not clinicians, meaning that it's not their job to be assessing um, or to, to, to be helping even. The idea with someone who is a peer is that they've been through something similar, so there's an ability to, to have a mutual relationship. And, and so, yes, for sure, I think that we're, we're living in times now um, where more and more it's going to be important um, to, to train people on all fronts around, around that. Um, I'm just so impressed and grateful and hopeful about everything that Sasha has been saying, you know, when it comes to, you could pretty much name any issue, opi the opioid epidemic or, you know, there are so many intersections of so many issues that crisscross through this society and you could make links between them, but you got to, somebody's got to pick up thread, some thread somewhere. Um, and the idea of this peer initiative seems to me fantastic. Um, a wonderful development. Right on. All right, thank you all. I want to thank you both. Um, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and throughout the week. Um, please help spread the word, grab brochures. Thank you very much. <laughs>